So I think we're, um, we're just at the threshold of a, a new era in uh, quantum control and, and feedback and reservoir engineering for super detecting qubits. And this era is made possible by tremendous technological advances in building quantum limited microwave amplifiers uh, based on dose injections. So the progress that we've made in building better qubits has allowed us to build better amplifiers, which allows us to measure the qubits better and do new kinds of experiments involving quantum uh, error correction and quantum feedback. So, uh, as I uh, mentioned last time, the circuit QED is a platform for extreme nonlinear quantum optics. It's also a potential hardware ar architecture for quantum information processing. Here's a little uh, kind of overview of the state of the field four years ago. And uh, some of the challenges that are facing uh, us now are, are, are quantum error correction. There's been some initial success doing a three qubit uh, repetition code, first simplest possible rudimentary quantum error correction that's been performed. People have started to think about it. I mentioned briefly last time uh, topological codes. But the ultimate goal of having a logical qubit made up of a series of physical qubits which form a uh, error correction protection of the logical, the information stored in the logical qubit, and then that's concatenated with another level of error protection and so forth until you can produce a qubit which lives, or, or that is you can produce a logical qubit whose space coherence time greatly exceeds the phase uh, coherence times of the individual physical components, so effectively a building an immortal or nearly immortal qubit. That goal has, uh, of course, is still some distance off, but we're at the beginning of that era. <coughs> so um, quantum feedback is a related topic, uh, and you have some system you want to know, you want to drive it towards some desired state, perhaps in an active manner by um, measuring something about it, getting the classical measurement results, and then performing unit, a unitary transformation based conditioned on those classical error signals that tell you how much your actual state deviates from uh, the desired state. That's one model. It's a little confusing in quantum mechanics because you know that when you measure something, there's back action which, you know, associated with wave function collapse, which changes the something that you're measuring. So your feedback loop may have to take that into account. And so I will show you a bit of data uh, where one can see that quantum back action resulting we measure and if you, you can't build amplifiers that are low noise and not nearly perfect enough to see this weak back action effect, so you can't possibly uh, produce a quantum feedback. Uh, there's another kind of setup, kind of autonomous feedback, in which um, uh, <coughs> you don't have classical measurement signals that come up to your room temperature apparatus for decision making and be sent back down, that there's somehow uh, feedback associated with it. There's some ancilla degrees of freedom that are embedded directly in the system as a kind of quantum bath, which uh, produces a dissipation that autonomously drives the system towards some desired state. So typically, uh, if I had a qubit connected to a cold bath and it could spontaneously 
uh, emit a photon, uh, it could, it, you know, the dissipation would drive it to the ground state, or if the bat unfortunately had some planet kind of temperature, it would drive you more towards the ground state than the excited state. But here we're interested in engineering the quantum reservoir, the quantum bath, to have some interesting properties which will cause the system to be driven to some more interesting state, like a coherent superposition of ground and excited state, with a qubit pointing in the x direction instead of down. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, so here's uh, just a one little example about the progress that's been made with building quantum limited amplifiers. Uh, so here is the, the two quadratures of the output of uh, the cavity, I, Q. And uh, uh, this is uh, actually the vacuum state. There's no no photons are being sent to the cavity and reflected at the camp, or it's just listening to the vacuum. And you see here some spread in the quadrature amplitudes of uh, I and Q that are being measured. And that spread is almost entirely vacuum noise. It's not noise, uh, extra noise added by the amplifier. Are there units on these plots? Ah, so what are the units? Thank you. So the, the energy is I squared plus Q squared in units of photon number. So this is like uh, uh, if, if I m were 2 and Q m were 0, there, you know, that corresponds to an energy of 4 photons. So this is the half, you know, half a photon of 0 point energy. Um, and uh, the qubit that's inside this cavity uh, is going to be measured by sending a signal to the cavity. I'm looking for a phase shift, as I mentioned before. But right now, there's no signal being sent. And uh, okay, it's not showing up very well. But the qubit is initially oriented in the minus y direction. So this is a bit of a peculiar thing. It's um, a strong projective measurement of the qubit after an initial weak measurement that was made by sending photons to the cavity. Uh, in this case, sending zero photons. No measurements actually made. So you see that no matter what the signal of I and Q is, the, the resulting uh, uh, qubit orientation is uh, there's no z component, no x component, and the y component is minus one. But if I send in a very weak signal containing only a fraction of a photon on average, uh, there's a there's a dispersive coupling that we talked about before of the qubit to the cavity that's going to produce. Uh, so here's the uh, uh, sort of classical here in state that's being sent in, and the reflected wave it picks up a phase shift depending on the state of the qubit. And uh, that phase shift may be small enough that it's hard to resolve because of the vacuum noise. And in fact, because it's uh, a tiny fraction of a photon on average, it is small. Uh, but that tiny weak measurement produces a little bit of wave function collapse, a little bit of back action on the qubit. And uh, the, the uh, setup is such that the I quadrature tells us about that phase shift. It tells us uh, whether the qubit is up or down. And initially, the qubit was in the y direction, which is a coherent superposition of up and down. But if I pick up an I signal as this, as opposed to that, then I, I, it's very noisy, and then there's some overlap of the distributions. But by this Bayesian uh, story that Ash Park told you, there's a now we have some new information, which is biasing our our estimate towards positive Z. So here you see this what we call the Pepsi plot. <laughs> 
the if i comes out positive, then z is more likely to be positive, the z component of this pin. And if it comes out negative, uh, uh, it's more, uh, more likely that z is down. So it's in a superposition of up and down. And eventually, when we make a strong measurement, it's going to collapse to either up or down. And this represents a, a partial collapse. Uh, which can be rather strong if accidentally the signal comes out way over here, then you really are more likely to be up because you're, you're outside this uh, support of the, the blob here. You're really making a rather strong measure. But if the result comes out near zero, you, you, you don't know whether it's equally likely to come from this distribution or that distribution. And you haven't really gained any new information. Now this is a peculiar measurement in which we're not just measuring the one quadrature that, that we should be measuring, the one that tells us, encodes the information about whether the qubit is up or down. It turns out we're measuring both at the same time using a heterodyne procedure. And again, they're, they're incompatible observables, so that's why there's these fuzzy blobs. Uh, but measuring this component, as you can see, it, it doesn't distinguish the up and down. But it tells you a little bit about the shot noise, about the uh, number of photons that were in your coherent state. Uh, so this the interference between the classical drive amplitude and the vacuum, this component of the vacuum noise, that's fluctuations in the length of the vector. That's the, the photon number shot noise associated with the coherent state. And because there's, a, remember, this dispersive light shift, uh, the more photons in the cavity, the more the frequency of the qubit is shifted. And that, when the qubit is uh, pointing in the y direction, it's going to cause it to persist a little bit in the x direction. So the x component will move up or down. There'll be a little bit of additional back action. Uh, based on the fact that we're measuring both quadratures. If I had a phase sensitive amplifier that only was sensitive to this quadrature, then I would get this twice as much information here, and there'd be no back action in this direction. So the, this is this weird example of depending on what you, what the back action depends on exactly what measurement you make. This is, uh, from Michelle Deberet's group, and we'll be coming out in something short. So it's this progress in quantum limited amplifiers that permits us to see uh, the back action from a weak measurement by making a subsequent strong measurement. And uh, because we can see that weak back action with a good enough amplifier, then it's possible to do so the first quantum feedback uh, measurement was done by the uh, Berkeley group, uh, RBJ and Irfan Spiki. And uh, they did the following interesting experiment. They had a transon qubit in a 3D cavity. And they just Robbie flopped it. They put a tone on the qubit at the transition frequency and just caused it to coherently rotate from ground to excited to ground to excited to ground to excited over and over again. And then they'd stop at some moment and measure whether it was up or down. And by repeating that millions of times, uh, you would see this Robbie flopping. But because of dephasing, some, some effect that gets the Robbie oscillations out of phase because the qubit decayed or Phase. Uh, when you ensemble average those many measurements, these sinusoidal oscillations eventually decay away after a few microseconds. Okay? So the amplitude of the drive determines the Rabi frequency, but it doesn't control the phase of the oscillations. That can, if the qubit accidentally fell to the ground state at some point, lost its superposition, the Rabi oscillations would just start over, but with some new phase. And when you ensemble average it for, over all those different phase events, you, you lose, you know, you, you lose track of the coherent. 
But now suppose you do something strange, which is send in a weak measurement tone at the cavity frequency to see whether the, uh, what the phase of the Rabi oscillations is. If I sent in a very strong tone, that would be bad, because I would immediately collapse the qubit to up or down randomly. And I would mess up the, the Rabi oscillations I'm trying to observe. On the other hand, if I send in a measurement tone which is too weak, the other intrinsic dephasing effects are going to happen faster than I can gain any information about the phase of the Rabi oscillations. So the, the, the measurement rate, which is itself destroying the the, you know, there's measurement-induced dephasing. It's, it's destroying the Rabi oscillations. We want that rate to be faster than the natural uh, dephasing rate that you see here, but not much faster than that. And then, uh, so you get out this very weak, noisy signal, <coughs> run it through a parametric amplifier and mixer, and you get out an error signal that says, oh, the Rabi oscillations are a little bit ahead in phase of where they should be, or a little bit behind. And you can then feed back an error signal on the amplitude of the Rabi drive, because high amplitude makes the Rabi oscillations go faster, and low amplitude makes it go slower. So you can correct for the, uh, any phase error that you have by feeding back like this. And when you turn on this feedback loop, the, uh, there's a little bit of uh, some transient here. It's not a perfect uh, feedback loop in terms of bandwidth and phase delay and so forth. But the Rabi oscillations then persist forever. So forever in this case being up to uh, a millisecond. And the contrast that you see here, which is uh, <coughs> Uh, I don't know, 40 percent or something, uh, is an indication of the uh, imperfections in the feedback circuit. Uh, some small noises added by the uh, parametric amplifier, some losses in the signal due to the circulators that you're forced to put in place before the amplifier, uh, some finite Know, the measurement rate not being vastly larger than the natural dephasing rates and so forth. But this is a pretty amazing for a first ever quantum feedback result in a condensed matter fit system to achieve this sort of 40% contrast. It's actually pretty impressive. Okay. All right, so that's the kind of feedback where you make a measurement. And despite the fact that the measurement itself is kind of bad, it's, it's dephasing the thing you're trying to control. It gives you enough information to be back and uh, make, make, make a unitary operation, namely change the Rabi oscillation rate, uh, condition on the result of those classical measurement signals. Now I want to talk about the other case of uh, kind of autonomous feedback or some magical thing where you just push a button and turn on various drives and dis dissipations, and the system just goes into some desired state automatically. And uh, so there's this paper that uh, the Berkeley group, again, did based on some ideas that we had for cavity-assisted quantum path engineering. So the goal would be to try to create the dissipator which will drive the system to a spin to any point, desired point on the black sphere, for example, the plus x direction. So we want to make a coherent superposition of uh, g and e that lasts forever. Now this is not a way to store quantum information that lasts forever, because no matter what coherent state I start in, G minus E, G plus E, G, E, anything, it all, it's a dissipative system. It always falls to this state and forgets its initial state. 
So it's preserving coherence, but in a funny, dissipative way. So it's not a way of making a ecoherence free subspace or something. Okay. Uh, so we want to understand that we normally think of noise and dissipation as, as bad. Uh, for quantum coherence, but here we're going to use it to maintain this quantum coherence. And uh, again, here's this review on quantum noise, which uh, Ash Clark and I and others uh, were involved with, which you might find useful. Okay, so um, suppose I have a qubit with some transition frequency omega q. And there's some external force or uh, perturbation f of t that couples to sigma x. Sigma x doesn't commute with sigma z, so it's going to cause transitions between the energy eigenstates. And I'm going to be talking about quantum noise and positive and negative frequencies. This is going to be have quite a bit of overlap the next few slides with things that Ash Clark can talk to you about, and I'm going to review actually optomechanical cooling, but I, uh, hopefully it won't hurt you to see it again. And, uh, and then by analogy to optomechanical cooling, we're going to figure out a way to cool the qubit in interesting superpositions. So um, if classically, you know, this is just some real function of time, and its autocorrelation function, of course, will be real. And so uh, it's the spectral density, just the uh, Fourier transform of that, will be symmetric in frequency. But it's not true quantum mechanically, because uh, if this is some quantum operator of a bath, then uh, it doesn't necessarily commute with itself at different times. And therefore, this product of two operators is not itself, each of which is Hermitian, is not itself Hermitian. So you might think somehow people get confused and say, oh, then I can't possibly um, measure that correlator, but that's not true. So as a result of this not being a Hermitian operator, uh, this correlation function can be complex. And if it can be complex, then its spectral density can be asymmetric frequency. And that's the hallmark of quantum noise that Ash uh, talked about. So <clears throat> here's an example. Suppose that the bath is, uh, this force is just the position of some harmonic oscillator in the bath. Very simple example. Then the autocorrelation function is easy to calculate for a harmonic oscillator. Let's say in a harmonic oscillator in the vacuum state or, or in a thermal state, sorry. Then uh, there are two different correlators that will contribute, B, B dagger, and B dagger, B. And they don't have the same value. One is, if it's in thermal equilibrium, it's N boson plus one times this time dependence, and the other is n boson times that time dependence. So this is complex. And it's Fourier transform, since these are purely sinusoidal. Fourier transform will have a delta function at positive omega naught with a coefficient n boson plus 1, and a delta function at uh, minus omega naught with coefficient so it's asymmetric to the extent that nb and nb plus 1 are different. This guy corresponds to stimulated emission. The bath is absorbing energy from the thing that's coupled to it. And that's spectral density at positive frequency. 
this corresponds to absorption. You only can absorb energy from the bath if it's at finite temperature. Here there's a one, so even at zero temperature you could emit into the bath, but you can't uh, absorb from the bath unless it has quantum in it. And that corresponds to the spectral density at negative frequencies. Okay. So the, uh, the quantum noise, you know, in general for a more complicated system wouldn't be two delta functions like that. It might be some funny shape like this. And positive frequency corresponds to uh, the bath absorbing energy from the system due to spontaneous emission of the system into the bath. And any weight at negative frequencies corresponds to real quantum coming out of the bath into your system. In thermal equilibrium, the ratio of the noise power at plus and minus omega, that's just detailed balance, emission versus absorption, and it's e to the beta h bar omega, or beta is the inverse temperature. But even if the, as Ash talked about, even if the system is, you know, some cavity full of laser photons, if it's not any equilibrium circumstance, provided that your system talks to the noise bath only at one frequency, plus omega or minus omega, you can always define an effective temperature by that ratio. If your system talks to the bath at more than one frequency, then this will be true only in true thermal equilibrium. You won't be able to define the temperature otherwise. Is that clear? But even the weirdest, wildest, non-equilibrium thing, if you're a high-Q oscillator that listens to that noise only at one frequency, you're going to think it has a temperature given by the ratio of uh, emission to absorption rates. And of course, in the limit h bar goes to zero, this always goes to one. That's the classical result that the spectral density is always symmetric in frequency classical. OK, now uh, I, I really, uh, the most interesting part of writing this uh, long review, which took many people many years, for me was I completely changed my understanding of Fermi's golden rule and in terms of noise correlators. So um, if you think of this as a noise source, it could be classical or it could be quantum operators or some that. This perturbation has a matrix element of one that connects you from the excited to the ground or the ground to the excited states. Then the Fermi's golden rule transition rate for the, for the bath for falling down and having the bath absorb is just given by the spectral density of the noise at plus omega q, the transition frequency of the qubit. And the up rate, gamma 0 goes to 1, is given by the spectral density at minus omega. And uh, I, all this business when you derive Fermi's golden rule, the time has to be longer than a certain time and shorter than another time. And, it, and there's all these funny representations of delta functions and things. Uh, I never understood that. And I, I, the derivation here in terms of thinking of the evolution of the wave function of this thing in the presence of this white noise perturbation that causes the elements of the wave function to kind of random walk, uh, I, I find extremely useful. So I urge you, the students, to do this. But this is, again, consistent with the spectral density of positive frequency and negative frequency causing corresponding to the path. Okay, so uh, let's quickly use these ideas to review the thing that Ash talked about, which is optomechanical cooling. And uh, here you have uh, 
the frequency of a, a cavity parametrically dependent on the position of the mirror or the oscillator. And the co coupling coefficient g is the derivative of the resonance frequency with respect to the position. And you can see then that uh, the photon <coughs> shot noise acts as a force on the mirror because the derivative of the energy with respect to position is the force minus the force. And uh, I've subtracted away the average uh, shot noise, which just maybe moves the mirror to some new equilibrium position. And it's the fluctuations of the photon number that act back as a radiation pressure on the uh, mechanical system. So people are always drawing various spectral densities, and it gets a little confusing. So I'm going to draw for you here first the dotted lines, these are electric field spectral densities, not photon number spectral densities. And here, for example, is the vacuum noise in the cavity. It's, it's sitting here at the cavity resonance frequency, omega r. And it only has support at positive frequency. There's nothing at negative frequencies because the vacuum is the vacuum. It's cold. There are no actual photons around. So the bath can absorb energy from uh, the mechanical system, but it can't put energy into it. Then there's a classical laser drive at omega L, and its electric field spectral density is delta function at the drive frequency, and then minus the drive frequency, and it's symmetric because it's um, effectively just a big classical drive. Okay? So that's this. And now, let's look at the, what I would call the rectified vacuum noise. <laughs> that is, I want to look at the, uh, not the electric field but the electric field squared, the photon number inside the cavity. So there's two sources of electric fields, the classical drive and the vacuum noise. And I'm going to square it. I'm going to, the, you know, the coupling to position is, is energy density. So I'm going to square it like a, like a mixer in a radio. And I'm going to take this term and multiply it into the vacuum noise here and get something at very low frequency. I'm, uh, right now, the laser is red detuned from the cavity. And I'm going to take the big negative frequency component of the laser, multiply it into the positive frequency component of the vacuum noise, and get noise at a low frequency centered on the detuning of the laser drive from the vacuum noise. Okay? So this is the not electric field vacuum noise. This is the photon number spectral density, SN of omega. Is that clear? Very important distinction. And it's this guy, this is the radiation pressure shot noise spectral density that's going to be driving the mechanics. And it's down at some nice low frequency, not up at a cutter, it's, but it's at the detuning. It's at a frequency I can control. In this case, most of its support is at positive frequency because I use negative detuning. And as I showed last time, if you work out the details, the shot noise spectral density is, well, if you were to integrate over all frequencies, I mean, it would just be uh, the Poisson statistics and bar. But the actual spectral distribution is peaked at the detuning, and uh, it's a Lorentzian, and its width is given by the decay of the cavity. So the photons are in there, and they stay in there quite a long time on the scale of you know, 1 over kappa, the decay of the time of the cavity. And uh, 
so now if we're clever and choose that detuning to be equal to the mechanical frequency of the mirror, then the, this positive frequency spectral density will be very effective at removing energy from the mirror and putting it into the bath via what's effectively a Raman process where you take one of the laser dry photons and you up convert it in an anti Stokes process to land on the cavity resonant resumption. So the optomechanical cooling rate is given is proportional to this spectral density at this mechanical frequency. I'm assuming the good cavity limit where there's no uh, spectral, almost no spectral density at minus. And, uh, this first full quantum theory of the optomechanical cooling appeared in two back to back parallels. Okay, so that's a review of the things that you heard about from Ash. Now I want to steal all those ideas and use them to produce a magic bath which cools a qubit to an arbitrary superposition state, let's say the plus x state. And uh, <clears throat> so I uh, had this idea that it might be doable a couple years ago. My Yale colleagues somehow didn't get excited about it. I mentioned it to Irfan Siddiqui at the March meeting. And literally three weeks later, uh, Kato Birch had data. It was amazing. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, do two things. We're going to drive the cavity uh, red or blue detuned as in the, in the optomechanical experiment. And we're going to drive the qubit, we're going to Robbie flop the qubit at some rate omega r. And let's see what those com combination of things does. So if I go into a frame which is rotating at the dry frequency, which is the same as the two-bit <coughs> transition frequency, then the effect of Hamiltonian, uh, you know, the original sigma z term goes away, and all I have is this Rabi drive, omega r sigma x. So if the qubit was initially in, <coughs> in the ground state, and I suddenly turn on this perturbation, it's going to begin to process around the x-axis and go from ground to excited to ground to excited as I described before, it's going to Robbie flop. <coughs> so <coughs> the original, uh, because I'm driving the qubit at this transition frequency and going into a rotating frame, I have a, a two degenerate states, and their degeneracy is lifted by the Robbie split. And those two eigenstates are, of course, eigenstates of sigma x as viewed in this rapidly rotating frame. Uh, so plus x and minus x, and they're coherent superpositions of the ground and excited space. Now this, uh, so, you know, if I, if I turn this on suddenly, starting in the ground state, I'm in neither of those eigenstates. I'm in a coherent superposition, and that's what causes the Rabi flop. If I turned it on adiabatically, or if I waited for some dissipation to take care of this, I might end up in one of the two eigenstates. But that situation is not going to last because of the various uh, bath perturbations. So a typical value of this, of the qubit transition frequency is 5 gigahertz. The bath is very cold with respect to that, and if I do nothing, I'll be pretty much in the ground state. But in this rotating frame, where a typical value of omega Rabi, let's say I'll make up a nice round number, 21 megahertz, that corresponds to an effective splitting of one millikelvin. And the temperature is much, much warmer than that. So any uh, perturbations that cause dephasing and decay in the original frame of reference, they look very, very hot. They, they look like uh, really high temperature perturbations in this rotating frame. And eventually, I'm just going to go into an incoherent mixture of those two pseudo eigenstates. 
with almost equal probability. The polarization will be very, very close to zero because the, you know, the effective Zeeman field is, is only a millikelvin, and the actual temperature is uh, at least 10 times higher than that. It may not even be at a, a truly equilibrium. So uh, I'd like to produce a way of cooling this thing very, very cold, much colder than a millikelvin, much colder than the actual physical temperature, <clears throat> so that I'm sitting in either the plus x or minus x eigenstate, the almost exclusive. So let's try applying a tone to the cavity now, <clears throat> which will um, produce the analog of this optical mechanical cooling. So we're going to drive the cavity off resonance by <clears throat> red D2 by the Rabi frequency. So before it was the mechanical frequency, which is not really under our control. You make the mirror and it has a fixed frequency. But here the Rabi frequency is actually under our control. It's how strongly we're driving the qubit. And it'll be on the scale of tens of megahertz. So now I'm going to send a tone to the cavity. And it's going to produce uh, photon shot noise in the cavity. And remember, we have this dispersive coupling that I talked about, in which the qubit transition frequency has a quantized light shift, or the cavity frequency has a frequency shift that depends on the state of the qubit. But unlike the previous case where I was bragging about how this could be thousands of linelets, and here it was intentionally chosen to be small so that we could do a perturbative theory of the cooling that this perturbation causes. Okay? So now we've kind of uh, uh, interchanged x and z in a funny way here. We want to get an eigenstate of sigma x. We have a noise source that couples to sigma z, which doesn't commute with sigma x. So it causes transitions between the x eigenstates. So this term, which was purely dephasing in the original lab frame, is now like a T1 effect. It, it causes transitions between the x eigenstates. And we know that the photon shot noise is going to have spectral density that peaks <coughs> at plus omega rabi because we choose, chose the detuning to be minus omega rabi. And that's exactly the, the frequency that we need to drive for that shot noise to drive transitions between the two dress states of the qubit. And again, we get anti-Stokes processes in which the drive photons get up converted to the cavity frequency and the uh, qubit gets driven from the minus x state to the plus x state. And the effective temperature of this photon shot noise can be uh, micro Kelvin, you know, in the good cavity vision, and can manage to cool this thing down even though it's got a million Kelvin energy and it's fighting, it has to fight all the intrinsic dephasing sources. Uh, so again, uh, the cooling ray is proportional to the coupling and the photon shot noise spectral density in perturbation theory in the resolved sideband limit. And uh, there's uh, a shot noise absorbed energy from the dress state of the qubit. And so here is an experiment in which one does a uh, Ramsey fringe experiment. One makes a pi over two pulse, waits a long time, and makes another pi over two pulse to see if the coherent x state that you produced has survived. And uh, it does for a while, but decays away. Now we're going to. Uh, turn on this cooling mechanism, which is basically, for those of you that know about jump operators, it's, it's trying to produce uh, jumps that take you from the wrong x state to the right x state. 
And uh, we're even going to dispense with the initial pi over 2 pulse. We're just going to turn on the cooling, and magically it's going to cool the uh, qubit into the coherent superposition state, for which a subsequent pi over 2 pulse will, with, uh, will uh, give you the uh, desired frame frequencies. And so you turn it on, and the um, coherence lasts essentially forever. And it rises up in a, in a microsecond or so, and it saturates. So you don't even need to initially start the system in the X direction and the cooling to try to get there. You can just start in the ground state, and the cooling will drive you there within a microsecond. The fact that you see these fringes is because the phase of this subsequent pi over 2 pulse that maps phase into the thing we measure, so you can see, is, is, is being varied. So that you can, for technical reasons. So, uh, so now we have active feedback <coughs> that gave us Rabi oscillations that last forever, and passive autonomous feedback that gave us, in some funny sense, Ramsey frames that last forever. Uh, I won't skip over the details because it's late, but um, if you were to draw, all of this was assuming you were driving the qubit right on its resonance when you're doing the rocket plotting. If you detune the drive on the qubit slightly, then there's an effective field also in the z direction, not just the x direction. And you can actually park the qubit anywhere you want on the block sphere, not just on the equator. And you can use red or blue detuned drive tones to produce uh, this state or that state of the qubit. I'll skip over the details here, but they're, they're in the paper. And that, that actually works. Uh, there's also some interesting things that uh, go beyond this perturbative quantum noise picture. You can actually make the coupling of the qubit to the path so strong that it uh, puts an anti-Stokes photon in the cavity, and then sucks it back, and then puts it back, and takes it back. And you can get the analog of kind of back to Rabi oscillations uh, uh, ringing as the system cools. Again, I'll skip over those details. We saw some hints of that in the Berkeley data, but we don't have a quantitative view to the particular experiment. So, uh, so this is kind of two examples of very early days of quantum feedback. And there are a lot of interesting ideas pre-existing and now being developed about um, could you use multiple qubits and cool produce dissipators that produce interesting entangled states. Uh, 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 lots of interesting ideas. Uh, there are some experiments in quantum optics where you have three photons that are coupled to a die bath, and they can come to equilibrium and produce a kind of BEC. There might be some analog of that that you could do in circuit QED, where you have a series of resonators, and then you would have a series of nonlinear elements with ready to Raman pumps that would uh, try to uh, take an incoherent drive here and produce a coherent quasi condensator photon in this array. So uh, I hope that gives you some um, idea of the recent remarkable experimental progress in this area. And I'm happy to take questions.